2020 and this is the second video of three describing the three different ways that bacteria can transfer genetic information horizontally. So you'll recall that um, previously, the previous video, we talked about Frederick Griffith's, Griffith's uh, discovery of transformation, which is the uptake of naked DNA by a competent bacterial cell. And um, so what we're going to hopefully do next is we're going to do um, conjugation. And conjugation is the only type of horizontal gene transfer in which the donor bacterium is actually alive. <clears throat> so um, in gram-negative bacteria, um, gram-negative bacteria, if they if they carry a special DNA sequence that encodes the genes to carry out um, conjugation, <laughs> then the um, the bacteria can act as a donor. Okay, so we'll excuse me. We'll talk about um, the work that was originally done, and again, it's in E. coli. E. coli was kind of the model um, bacterium in which a lot of the early genetic work was done. So if we look at E. coli. And if E. coli has a special DNA sequence called the fertility factor, or the F factor, um, then it can become a donor in conjugation. So the fertility factor, it's a DNA sequence that encodes information for this cool sex pillus, also called a conjugation pillus or an F pillus. <clears throat> so the fer fertility factor DNA carries the genes um, to make the pillin protein subunits. So this beautiful sex pillus is made up of these little um, pillin protein subunits and they're organized so they form like a hollow tube, almost like a straw. So over here, by definition, if a bacterium carries the F factor, we call it F plus. And by definition, if you have the fertility factor, you're going to be the donor. <clears throat> and then your recipient is going to be a, a bacterium in E. coli that lacks the F factor. So the recipient is going to be F negative. So the um, bacteria communicate with um, chemical messengers called pheromones, and that will permit a donor to recognize a recipient in the neighborhood, and that will trigger um, formation of this long, 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 beautiful sex pillus. So by assembling the, um, the pill and protein subunits, the pillus gets longer and longer until it touches the surface of the recipient. Now, the recipient in response to the pheromones released by the male, the recipient has made um, special proteins on its surface that will act as basically the receptor for the tip of the sex pillus. So the sex pillus con makes contact with the receptors on the recipient, and then what's so cool is the donor then disassembles the pillus, and that's going to shorten it and bring the recipient into close, close, close physical contact. And then at that point, the base of the sex pillows acts as almost like a hypodermic syringe and needle. The donor is going to transfer a copy of donor DNA into the recipient. And we'll see that there's some different versions of what DNA can be transferred. So again, this is conjugation in our gram negatives. Gram positives can also carry out conjugation, but the gram positive bacteria, usually they, they don't form the long a beautiful impressive sex pillows. Usually they have a little bit smaller um, conjugation bridge here. So again we're going to focus on the gram negatives. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in talking about conjugation we can talk about different matings and I know that's that's really misleading because we said this isn't sex. These, these are not true matings but <clears throat> historically <clears throat> we've talked about um, different types of, of matings. Um, amongst E. coli. So this first meeting is kind of the simplest one. This is going to be our donor, <clears throat> our F plus donor, fertility factor positive, and then we're, um, the donor is going to donate DNA to the recipient, the F negative, right over here. Now in this first meeting, when we say F positive, um, historically when the F factor is in the form of a plasmid, Right, so we'd call this the F plasmid. Historically, that donor is called an F plus donor. Okay, so again, our F plus donor 
has the F factor in the form of a plasmid. And here's the donor's chromosomal DNA. Here's our recipient. And we're right at the stage, folks, where the donor is going to transfer a copy of DNA to the recipient. And the copy of DNA is going to be a copy of this, if the, of the X, excuse me, the X factor. That'd be awesome. No, a copy of the F factor, a copy of the F plasmid. So here we see that the donor is transferring a copy of the F plasmid to the recipient. So there it goes. Okay. And then now the recipient has received a copy of the F plasmid. Right, this conjugation bridge will be broken and we'll have our two separate um, cells. And what's kind of interesting here is we see now the recipient is no longer recipient because the recipient carries the F factor, carries the F um, plasmid. Now the recipient becomes a donor. And you might ask, well, you know, kind of uh, as far as evolution goes, why is this helpful? You know, it's just like passing this F plasmid around. <clears throat> well, we'll see. Um, in the next slide, that this F factor, this F plasmid, it can integrate itself into the chromosome of the bacterium. <clears throat> and then when that bacterium um, acts as a donor, the bacterium can actually pass a copy of chromosomal DNA to a recipient. So that's how we're going to get antibiotic resistance genes transferred, virulence factor genes um, transferred, um, genes for, say, capsule production. Okay. So in, in comparing conjugation, folks, to transformation, do notice that the donor is alive. Um, remember, in transformation, the donor was dead. So in conjugation, it's the only time where, where both the donor and the recipient will be alive. <clears throat> so folks, this is where things get a little bit more interesting. So this um, slide shows a formation of what's called an HFR donor. And HFR stands for high frequency of recombination. This is when the F plasmid the F factor inserts itself into the E. coli um, chromosome. So here we, we start out, you guys, with a donor just with the F plasmid, so just a regular old F plus cell. And notice here there's a hot spot, so-called hot spot, on the bacterial chromosome um, into which the F plasmid can insert itself. So here's that insertion event occurring. No DNA is cut out. The um, F factor just kind of pushes its way into the chromosome at those hot spots. So here we see now our donor has the F factor, um, but it's inserted into the chromosome. So we're not going to call this like an F plus donor because it, um, it no longer has a plasmid. We're going to call it an HFR donor. So again, HFR is when the F factor is integrated into the donor's chromosome. And we're going to see this is an, this is an amazing donor now. Because when this donor mates with another um, recipient, now this donor can transfer, lost my pointer here, this donor now can transfer a copy of part of the chromosomal DNA to the recipient. So that's really going to increase genetic diversity. So let's see the second mating. This is an HFR, right, where we have the fertility factor integrated into the donor chromosome, meeting with an F negative recipient. And this is sometimes a little bit hard to explain, but let's see what we can do here. So you guys, when um, the HFR cell is ready to transfer a copy of the don uh, donor DNA to the recipient, the transfer starts about midway in the F factor. So if you can imagine, like right where my pointer is, um, the, the chromosome including that F factor is going to be copied and right at this point, the copy of half the F factor is going to lead the way, kind of pulling a copy of the donor chromosomal DNA through the conjugation bridge and into the recipient. So again, folks, um, here we see the transfer occurring. This would be just half of the F factor. okay? And for the recipient to receive both half, halves of the F factor, um, this first part would have to be transferred, and then an entire copy of the donor chromosome would have to be transferred before the second half of the F factor would be transferred to the recipient. Now that usually takes about 90 minutes and out in nature, say these are two E. coli in your intestine, usually there's so much movement of fluid, food, maybe feces, that this delicate conjugation bridge is broken before transfer of both, half, both halves of the F factor is accomplished. So what usually happens is the recipient receives only part of the F factor 
and then a copy of some of the donor chromosomal um, DNA. Okay, so we're gonna um, we're gonna let these guys transfer, and then we're gonna break the bridge. So we see here our HFR HFR donor remains HFR, but what's gone on over here? Well, the recom the excuse me the recipient has remained F negative because the recipient didn't didn't um, receive both halves of the F factor. So if you only get half the F factor, you're still F negative, right? You can't be a donor. But what what but what was accomplished was we transferred some a copy of some of the donor's chromosomal DNA into the recipient. And again, through um, homologous recombination, we can get some of the donor DNA replacing some of the recipient's DNA. So this recipient, even though it remains a recipient, it's, it's still F negative, it has acquired some new DNA from the donor. So we would call this a, re a recombinant. Okay. And again, that's going to increase genetic diversity in the bacterial population, and that will increase the chance that the population of bacteria will survive in ever-changing environments. <clears throat> and then, folks, um, we'll just go ahead and, and um, finish with the third type of horizontal gene transfer. This is called transduction. So be careful, folks. It's easy to confuse transformation with transduction. And in transduction, donor bacterial DNA is going to be transferred to the recipient um, by a bacterial virus or bacteriophage. Um, once we get into the virus unit, we'll talk about different types of bacteriophage, and then we can talk about two different types of transduction. But right now, you guys, we're just going to try to keep it really, really simple. So um, just you have to we have to understand a little bit about um, bacteriophage replication. So you guys, in this particular um, example, we're going to talk about the lytic replication cycle of bacteriophage. And then we'll just, again, we'll try to keep this relatively simple. So folks, here's our donor bacterium. And notice it has a dark purple chromosome. It always helps when they're color-coded. And these little spaceship little guys here, these are going to be the bacterial viruses called phage. And so this little icosahedral structure here. This is made out of protein. It's referred to as the phage capsid or the head. And then this little hollow tube is the tail. Um, and the pink in here is the phage DNA or viral DNA. So what happens is the bacteria phage, they attach to the outside of the bacteria cell. They attach to sp special receptors on the bacteria cell wall. And then um, they inject their DNA across the cell wall, across a um, cell membrane into the cytoplasm of the donor bacterium and then it's it's really sad because then the bacterial um, RNA polymerases transcribe the phage um, DNA into phage mRNA and then the bacteria ribosomes translate the mRNA into phage proteins and then um, the bacterial DNA polymerase um, can make copies of the phage DNA so this is actually horrible because the poor little bacterium is contributing to its own death, right? So now the E. coli can't take care of itself anymore. All it's doing is um, making phage DNA and phage proteins. And in this process, there's phage enzymes that cut up the um, donor chromosomal DNAs we can see here because the nucleotides are going to be used to make copies of phage DNA. Okay, But let's just remember you guys, sometimes a little piece of donor DNA won't be totally destroyed. So once phage proteins have been made and phage DNA has been copied, this is amazing you guys, the phage proteins, they self-assemble into those little heads, those capsids, and they package um, little pieces of DNA from the cytoplasm into the phage heads and then the tail assembles. This is just wild, you guys. But what we want to note here is most of these newly replicated phage are carrying phage DNA, but what about this little guy right there? What's happened? By accident, a piece of donor bacterial DNA got packaged in this little phage head, right? So um, after assembly, um, the phage release a lysozyme-like substance that helps break down the peptoglycan in the bacteria cell wall and then the, um, the, the newly replicated phage will be released through lysis of the bacterium. So again, here folks, we see the donor DNA is dead. The donor is dead, but, but 
donor DNA is being carried in this little phage right here. Now that phage can still attach to a neighboring bacterium, the recipient bacterium. It can still inject the neighboring bacterium with the donor DNA. And again, folks, through homologous recombination, that donor DNA can, um, can get itself inserted into the recipient's chromosome. Remember, through homologous recombination, the homologous sequence of the recipient's chromosome will be cut out and it will be replaced by the, um, the donor DNA here. So here we have our recombinants, our transductants, right? Um, so again, we have recipient chromosomal DNA, and here's the donor DNA that was delivered by the phage. So that process by which donor bacterial DNA is delivered to recipient bacterium is called transduction. And again, folks, in the next unit on viruses, we'll go into more detail about different replication cycles of different bacteriophage, and then we'll talk about the two different types of transduction. Generalized transduction, when any of the donor uh, chromosomal DNA can be transferred, and then another kind of more complicated type of, of um, transduction called specialized transduction, in which only very special or specific um, donor DNA fragments will be transferred. Okay, folks, let me see here. I think we're going to stop there. Okay, and what we'll do, for, this is actually a, a hot topic, a really good topic here, but let me let me stop here and we'll do a separate um, video um, answering this question, how did E. coli acquire this really <laughs> horrible toxin gene called the Shiga toxin gene, and we'll see um, that um, E. coli acquired this um, exotoxin protein toxin through specialized transduction, but we'll do that on another video. Okay. And then, folks, after we talk about that, um, then we're almost ready to wrap up. We're going to talk about plasmids, transposons. We'll just hit a little bit of um, um, natural selection and biological evolution and the importance of understanding those concepts for us to understand how, by us humans overusing antibiotics, we are selecting for antibiotic-resistant bacterial pathogens. Okay, but that'll be in, a, in the next movie.